Let us now try to understand science and Islam a little bit better. What is science? Science is basically a particular way of understanding the natural world. It extends our curiosity within, with which we are born. The purpose of science uh, is to ask four basic questions on, in any of the field of science. What is this? How does it work? How did it become like this? And how can we use this for our benefit? If we take any faculty of science, that's how it works. The science presumes that the world is understandable and universal. What it means is the un whole universe is one vast single system with consistent rules that can be studied and applied. For example, science believes that the same gravitation which explains the motion of um, objects falling on the earth also explains the motion of the moon and the planets. Scientific knowledge is durable. Uh, ideas are built upon the previous generation's research and findings. Um, for example, in making the theory of relativity, Einstein did not uh, just let go of Newton's laws of motion, but actually showed their limited application. Science is also a blend of logic and Im imagination. It does not exclude creati and, uh, creativity and imagination and often actually benefits from it. Scientists make careful observations and then they invent hypotheses and theories to make sense of these observations. And based on their imagination and their thought, scientists choose what to pay attention to, what data to collect, how to collect that data, and how to even interpret it. Scientists try to avoid identify and avoid bias. Like scientists are also human, and their nationality, sex, gen ethnic origin, their age, political convictions, all may incline them to look for or emphasize a certain kind of evidence. And they, they try to be highly alert, and they, that's what they strive to be highly alert to, pro, uh, to any possible bias, but um, such objectivity is not always achieved in 100%. Science demands evidence to be useful. A hypothesis should, should suggest what evidence would support it and what evidence would refute it. Evidence is obtained by observations, experiments, and measurements. Scientific ideas are evolutionary and also revolutionary. What that means is, Change in knowledge is inevitable because new observations will challenge existing theories. No matter how well one theory explains something, it is possible that another theory may fit just as well or even better. So in science, testing, improving, revising, and occasional discarding of theories, whether new or old, go on all the time. Like a lot of concepts that we learned um, 10 years ago are not applicable now. We have some new theories. Science cannot also provide answers to all questions. Many matters cannot be examined in a scientific way. Science is also not authoritarian. That means no matter how famous or highly placed uh, a certain scientist is, they do not have special access to truth. One scientist cannot decide for another. And there are no pre-established conclusions that any scientist must reach in science. What is Islam? Islam is Deen al-Fitra, that is the religion of the human nature. It guides man to the true faith and it guides man to the complete fulfillment of his own potential. It's a monotheistic religion, that means there's only it believes in only one God. And uh, it is an Abrahamic religion uh, taught by Prophet Ibrahim salam, articulated by the Quran. According to Islam, all prophets like of God like Musa salam, or Moses, Isa salam, or Jesus, and the last prophet, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, were sent to remind humans of this essential knowledge and to teach them the comprehensive guidance to living. Islam literally means submission to God and to attain and offer peace. Islam is a holistic way of life. There is no area or discipline of life which is not covered by Islam. And science is not, no different. From the very beginning, Islam directed people to cultivate scientific thought. Islam promotes and does not restrict thought. People of some religions may tell you to believe and not to think or question. However, in the Quran, Allah tells us again and again, Afala taqidun, which means we must think and ask questions. Don't you think? Quran keeps emphasizing. Allah tells us that we must think and ask questions and only then we should believe. So search, study and investigate. Think heavier and raise your level of thinking. The first commandment of Quran, the first word of Quran which was revealed was Ikra. The first word revealed to the Prophet Muhammad And this word Ikra means to read or to recite. It 
comes in Surah Al-Alaq. It shows us that there is no religion in the world that places as much importance on learning as Islam. Another important thing is in the prophetic model uh, of Islam, we pray with our eyes open. The problem occur, uh, some people believe that um, uh, religion contradicts the following of modern scientific research. This problem occurs when science is seen as a threat in some religions, in some faith traditions. And the assumption is made that all religions must be like that. All religions must discourage scientific inquiry. But Islam has been of a very, uh, Islamic history has been of a very in-depth scientific inquiry, even pioneering in the field of scientific inquiry. For example, Buddhists and many other faith traditions close their eyes when they pray. In many spiritual traditions, people meditate for hours and hours with their eyes closed. Secularists, on the other hand, reject the unseen entirely. The prophetic model is the only model that finds a balance between the seen and the unseen world. It is the only faith that engages with the seen world to better the unseen reality. The Muslim prayer, Salah, including the most humble position of prostration or the sajda, is performed with open eyes. Think about it. Wouldn't it be easier to pray and concentrate if you closed your eyes? But we are supposed to keep our eyes open. Why is this? It is a fundamental of this religion called Islam. We are supposed to connect with the unseen Allah while not losing fact of the fact that we are living in this world. Even in prayer, we don't get to disconnect ourselves from this world entirely. Why would the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the most connected to Allah, shorten his prayer when he heard a child crying? Shouldn't he be so engrossed in the prayer that he doesn't even heard an earthquake, let alone the child crying? There's also no concept of renunciation in uh, Islam. Uh, monkhood uh, or monasticism is a religious way in which somebody gives up everything in this world to live a very simple spiritual life. This is like a sadhu or a sadhvi tradition um, Jainism in Jainism, Bhikkhu or Bhikkhuni in Buddhism, Sanyas in Hinduism, Devdasi in Southern India and monk and nun traditions in Christianity. This concept of complete abandoning the, uh, of the life of pleasure and status uh, and lifestyle is not found either in Quran or the Sunnah. There does exist a practice of Sufism in some Muslim. Sufism is a wide term. It is a form of mysticism which means knowing God through experience rather than knowledge. It has a variety of meanings and implications. But Sufism in its extreme form has never been endorsed by Quran or Sunnah or any of the prophets including the Prophet Moses, Prophet Jesus, or the Prophet Muhammad In fact, extremism of any kind is not supported by Islam. Islam encourages the best in this life and the hereafter. Islam does not encourage low achievement in this life for the sake of hereafter. In fact, the famous supplication or prayer, which has remained unchanged for more than 1400 years, and it is found in the Holy Quran in Surah Baqarah, uh, verse 201, is Rabbana Atina fi dunya hasanatau wa fil akhirati hasanatau wikina adab annar, which means, O oh Lord, grant us good in this world and good in the life to come and keep us safe from the torment of fire. Notice here the good in this world comes first and through it the good in the life to come. Also, another famous um, supplication of the Muslims is Rabbi Zidni Ilma, which means, O oh my Lord, advance me in knowledge. And that's also in the Holy Quran, Surah Taha verse number 114. What this means is we are not a spiritual people at the expense of living in this life. Today many have rejected religion completely and as a result many others have become extremists in religion. Islam teaches a balance between two things. Accumulating knowledge and making this life beautiful is an important aspect in Islam. Another important thing is a falsification test of uh, authentication in the Quran which is a very unique thing. If you look at a scientific community, they demand a test for falsification. They say, if you have a theory, don't uh, bother us unless you present with it a way that we can prove you wrong. And once we use that, then we will think about your theory. For example, when Einstein came up with his theory, he believed the, he said, I believe the universe works like this. And here are three ways to prove whether I'm wrong. The scientific community listened to him and subjected it to the test. And within six years, it passed all three. Now, interestingly, this is what Quran does. It has falsification tests, believe it or not. Some have already proven, been proven true and others are waiting to be discovered 
but no one in over 1400 years has been able to prove them wrong. Islam not only presents the beliefs, but it also offers many ways to prove that they're wrong. Quran says, first thing is produce something like this. The Quran says, if this book is not what it claims to be, then all you have to do is produce something like it to prove it is false. It is a fact that despite the strongest hostility that Islam and Muslims face from the world, no one has ever been able to produce something remotely close to even the shortest surah of the Quran. Another open challenge is to find a discrepancy. Imagine that a student takes an exam in the school and writes a note to the teacher at the end saying, this exam is perfect. There are no mistakes. Find one if you can. The teacher will not sleep until he finds the mistake. And yet this is the way that the Quran approaches people. It gives a clear challenge to a non-Muslim and invites him or her to find a discrepancy. Do, not, do they not reflect upon the Quran? If it had been from any other than God, they would have found within it much contradiction. And that's what uh, it says in Surah Nisa, uh, verse number 82. The next thing the uh, Quran says is prove it wrong if you can. If a person discredits or, or refuses some explanation, it is his obligation to find an alternate explanation. Similarly, you cannot simply deny the Quran's authenticity without sufficient proof. The Quran advocates that if one can find anything wrong and prove it, then he has a right to disqualify it. Another interesting feature of the Quran is that it repeatedly offers advice to the reader and advises them to research more. It informs about various facts and then advises, if you want to know more about this, or if you doubt what is said, then ask those who have knowledge. It is not usual to have a book that comes from someone with no training in geography, botany, biology, etc., who discusses these subjects and then says to the reader, to go and consult men of knowledge, if he doubts anything. Yet in every age, there have been Muslims who have followed this advice and have made surprising discoveries. The, the works of, um, for example, the works of Muslim scientists of many centuries ago are full of quotations from the Quran. These works state where their research took place, where they looked for information, and they affirm that the reason they looked in such and such a place was that the Quran pointed them in that direction. The Quran is full of amazing facts. Everything contained in it can be researched and established as true. For example, the Quran mentions the origin of a humankind and then tells the reader, research it. It gives the reader a hint where to look and then states one should find out more about it. Several years ago, a group of men from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, took this advice. They collected all the verses in the Quran which discuss, uh, discuss embryology and took them to a non-Muslim professor of embryology in University of Toronto, Dr. Keith Moore, and asked for his opinion. In fact, this led Dr. Keith Moore actually discovering a few things about the human embryo that were not known to the science before. These findings were made under the microscope, and he affirmed that no one could have known about this without a detailed study under a microscope. It was definitely not possible at the time when the Quran was revealed. Another interesting thing is the Quran uses an elliptical knowledge. Arabic knowledge is characterized as an elliptical knowledge. Ellipsis is basically the act of leaving out one or more words that are not necessary. For example, uh, we use three dot 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 in um, printed text to show that the words have been uh, left out. Entire Quran is full of ellipses. That by itself is there to make the reader study and find out more. When everything is spelled out for you, there's no scope for thinking. Allah does not want us to be passive reciters of the Quran. He wants us to be active studiers of the Quran. Another in scientific and scholarly approach in Quran is exhausting the alternatives. The chance of finding another way to dismiss the Quran is non-existent. The Quran confidently states, this book is a divine revelation. If you do not believe that, then what is it? For if it is not a revelation, then it is a deception. And if it is a deception, what is its origin? And where does it deceive us? Indeed, the true answers to these questions shed light on the Quran's authenticity and silence the unbelievers.